Hello there and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. And after about two years of playing this game, we finally got to more or less what we consider to be finished. We've solved the Fenestra puzzle, we've uh, more or less got a, uh, a victory spaceship running, we've put down the Crastorio transceiver thing, and we've done all of the non-infinite and non-semi-infinite researches. And so we thought this would be a good time to, to have a look back over everything that's gone on in the game. What a, what, what a caused us to build all of this stuff, how everything went, all those sort of things, and answer lots of questions that we've come up with ourselves, that have been submitted by you, the viewers, and so on, and let you know what we thought of the, uh, of the whole process and how things went. So in this video, we'll be taking a look at the first couple of questions, which is basically our thoughts and feelings on Space Exploration and Crastorio 2 themselves, and how things went for us, uh, and as is our way, we'll be rambling quite a bit around the topic, so we'll be covering quite a lot of other stuff as well. But then in future videos, we'll come back with things like how we felt about playing together and what things we do we do differently in the future and other, other such sort of things. So this will be the first video in a sort of retrospective series where we're going to look back on how everything went. So, let's get stuck in. The first question is, what did we like about K2SE? Well, my, I think the way I look at it is it's, it's, it's sort of, it's Factorio, but it's a lot more of it. And obviously we're, we are all very, very fond of Factorio, um, and that's why we play so much of it, uh, and I have played so much of it into, over, the, over the years. And so having, more so with 0 0.5, I'll admit, but not, Space Exploration 0 0.5 felt like Play Factorio until you launch the rocket, and then it turns out actually launching the rocket isn't the end. There's all of this extra stuff after that. 0.6 wasn't quite the same um, because it's, it's it's shuffled stuff around a bit, like uh, moving a load of the um, a load of the more advanced ground-based technologies to after some of the space sciences, like uh, like the advanced logistics and the um, artillery and a few other things like that have been moved a bit further on, and, and there's been a bit more of a sort of a rejigging of everything to make to try and get you into space sooner, because, well, it is space exploration, that's sort of the point of it. But back when I first played it, it very much felt like it was, it was play Factorio and then just carry on playing Factorio and, and there's so much more content available and that's so that very much appealed to me and it does quite a nice job now the, the 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 learning curve is a little bit bumpy in places but in general it does quite a nice job of just getting steadily harder and harder and harder so the first space science packs are a bit harder than the stuff you do down on Norvis then you get onto the four tiers all of which are gradually get harder as you go through them although to an extent I still I still feel that the first one of each one is perhaps the hardest certainly harder than the second one because you have to go off and get the new resource but it, it, there's an attempt it's certainly an attempt in the right direction and then the deep space science is much harder after that and then the finestra puzzle is crazy difficult so it, it carries on ramping up and ramping up and ramping up which is quite nice so you get you get all of that extra stuff and also i think in in factory the whole game is about logistics whether it's belts or trains or pipes all of that sort of stuff so then having space exploration come along and adding in delivery cannons and cargo rockets and spaceships and uh, and space trains and arco chests and, and so on all all of that sort of stuff. It takes all of the, it takes Factorio and it just builds and builds and builds on it. And I think that's one of my that's probably my favourite thing about it. It's just it's like it's as if you carry it's as if you played normal Factorio, but then it just went on for approximately forever for about a thousand hours apparently in between. Well, no, sixteen hundred hours between us. And I, yeah, I, I quite like that. So it's the yeah, it's the the longer game. It gives you the bigger challenges with the more complex recipes. And also, you play around a lot with uh, with the byproducts. And I think the byproducts is quite an interesting thing because you don't really get that in, um, in 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 normal Factorio. About as close as it gets is is the is getting the heavy and light and, and petroleum gas out when you do oil cracking. Uh, so it's it's nice to have a bit more actually trying to recycle things. Now I'm going to come on to that in a little bit more detail in a bit, but because um, there's quite a lot of overlap between what did we like well between what I liked about K2SE and what I didn't like about it. So in a way, the two very much mesh together. So but I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment after giving other people a chance to uh, to rave and um, and, and uh, talk about what they like yeah i i just agree with that um, assessment because it's just more content basically to vanilla factorio it's and it's from a from a learning curve it feels very well balanced and it doesn't have uh <laughs> in my notes i wrote no cruel multi recipes a la payanodons um where you have <laughs> you know uh, you have to squish monkeys to i don't know get some other stuff to unlock a new recipe to do something else and have so many uh, fuels to fuel everything and 
it's it just uh, with the incremental increases over the science packs it just uh, gives you more content more stuff to do but eases you into each new recipe and that's uh, that's quite nice learning curve thinking of your yeah. uh, you're comparing it to pyanodon sorry i'm going to jump back in again i it also occurred to me i, I didn't write or maybe i wrote it down later um i was compared it to angel bobs as well so where mm. where angel bobs feels like it's taken the basic factorio game so burn a stage to rocket it makes each stage far more complicated and difficult yes. so making a, a, a circuit board requires 20 times as many different things going into it and it just spirals from then on whereas space exploration feels like it's done the opposite it's taken the, the original factorio fairly streamlined builds and then just extended them off into the distance so rather than rather than taking what we've got and making it wider it's taken what we've got and made it longer and i think i think that I think that works better. Now, to be fair, I, mean, I enjoyed both of them, but I think I think the space exploration way is probably slightly better. Well, that's a that's a really nice comparison because in my later notes I wrote uh, what to do next uh, to revisit Angel Bobs, <laughs> just to have a comparison to to that style of mod pack. Uh, so yeah, but that's I think that's a good you know with the width and length. Yeah, good that picture. could be quite, quite could be quite interesting. And uh, I did when I finished Angel Bobs, I made a few notes about what I would what I thought I would do differently if I revisited Angel Bobs, and one of them was, mm. one of the things was rush titanium for various reasons. I remember that much, but I th and I think it has changed quite a bit in the last. Four years probably since I played it. It's about two years of mod pack. That seems reasonable. Uh, so it's yes, things things have it probably will have changed a bit in in that time, and it could be quite interesting to revisit it. But I think I'm more interested in playing completely new things in 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 the, in the short term. But we'll 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 come back to that again later in the uh, in the what next section. One of the things yeah. with the the different recipes for the same thing is that space exploration doesn't introduce multiple options right from the start. You get one option, and then later on, much later, it says. Oh, you could also make you could make it like this. Here is an upgrade. And generally, that's always obviously better, provided you've got a supply of iridium for the heat shielding, beryllium for the LDS, or various others. And so, it's an obvious. It's worth switching, provided I can. And yeah, provided and and, it, and you can sort of choose when you want to do it. So, like with, with yeah. all of the metal processings, with the with the iron and copper and whatever else, there's about four or five different ways you can produce them. But it's up to you when you want to upgrade. So it, the upgrade is clearly worthwhile. However, you don't have to do it immediately. You you, you can you can wait until you've until you've got the brain space or the resources to, to go off and do a massive rebuild. So uh, de yeah, definitely potential there for for doing things in various different ways. Yeah, and I I think I mean the thing I like links into that, which is that it's a, a nice gentle ramp up over time, relatively mm. speaking. A, a few slightly blunt steps, let's phrase it that way. Um, yeah. But for the most part, you, you are slowly building up your thing, and then as you get to the point where really you've used a lot of space, you can't fit much more in, you get beacons. You can't fit more spaghetti in that area, but you can still boost the machines. You can still do things like that with modules. You can keep ramping up. And then the idea is, as far as I can tell, especially on the, the Iridium front, no one step requires you know four bajillion tons of one single resource. It's all a little bit of a lot of things, which makes it worth doing. Because you know, I think we've all had that problem where you sit there and say this build requires industrial revolution 2 is kind of a bit like this this one requires four million ingots or sensible was like 400 of these things here it requires 12k copper ingots or whatever it happened to be yeah and there have been one or two things that have been ludicrously expensive like that but they've all been things like the k2 uh, transceiver and they're one-off buildings it's yeah okay we're it's ridiculously expensive but we need to do it once it's an, it's an end game novelty so sure yeah that's yeah. fine i think yeah buildings being expensive is fine and just the factorio ones should potentially be more expensive the the base buildings yeah i have had thoughts in the past more. about it would be interesting to sort of to make things a little bit more realistic and have the the cost of infrastructure being a lot higher because I mean, in the real world you you put quite a lot of effort into having as few trains running around as possible because trains are expensive to buy they're expensive to maintain and run and just keep keep around but in factorio trains cost peanuts you could put, they're, they're, they're they're cheaper than a science pack typically so you, you just build you go okay we'll put in another iron mine I'll, I'll have another train to run it then and, and so LTN technically allows you to do things with a lot fewer trains but it doesn't matter really that's that's one of the the, the smallest advantages of it because trains are just so so cheap they're almost irrelevant yeah I mean I, I think along that line the the thing which Factorio has at zero cost which in reality is usually your singular largest cost is uh, manpower yeah, oh, in, in reality that just 
free once you build them. Oh, well, it's, it's not even that. It's like in the early game, manually mining stuff, you know, doing the, the, the burner phase, that would be prohibitively expensive IRL because, you know, you've got to pay a whole lot of people to go and do I mean, compared to the rest of the game. This is why we, we, we do a lot of things in an automated way in the real world. But then when you sit there and say, okay, we're just going to send one person out and it doesn't matter if it takes ages for that core mine to produce enough stuff, it's technically free. You mm. Yeah, but IRL, you'd be paying the, the, the guy to go out there and do it. So you need, yeah, you almost need you need each machine to have a sort of an ongoing running cost that isesn't just electricity. That's, yeah, uh, yeah. Sophia has mentioned the um, the maintenance cost of the space elevator. Uh, how how and uh, maybe, yeah. maybe having something like that for trains. I and mean, you you have train batteries for the space trains, but again, that's 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 this is such a low cost because they just get taken away, recharged, and put back in again. Yeah, perhaps some yeah. perhaps some sort of maintenance ongoing maintenance that trains require, like uh, that could be it could just be some sort of special fuel they take that is very very expensive to make and they just burn it constantly something like that maybe i, I, I don't know I, th I think the problem is I, th I think a lot of these things would make the game less fun so uh, and that's an important point from game design mm. is it's got to be fun there's a reason why it's okay for you to walk around with pocket full of trains <laughs> yeah because it would be really dull if to move your first train you had to build a gantry and a bunch of cranes and then move it around <laughs> and then the, the chronal mass ejection has walked a bit of the track from the heat and now the trains are all falling off it and that means I've got to go and build special rigs to go and retreat. That would be horrible. I mean, oh, yeah. Okay, there are people who enjoy that, but it would still be really, <laughs> really irritating as a, a game mechanic. Yeah, agreed. And I think that's, that's one of the places where mods are really, really useful, is, is adding in things for those massive masochists out there who want the trains to, to break when there's when when they come to come to the end of a, end of a broken piece of line or something like that, or or they want things to fall off the end of conveyor belts in a massive pile, or anything like that. Then the, the mods can allow that, but um, yeah, without without subjecting all the rest of us to it, the rest of it to us. So uh, Topaz asks, so one of the biggest changes since the first first run through was space elevators, how, and how how do we think that changes things? Well. It's um, yes is the, is the first is, is the short answer. Mm. Yes, it does massively change things. The big the big difference it makes essentially is that your spaceships no longer have to land, and that means you can start. It means you can actually make spaceships that are just using ion engines, so they only fly from space station to space station. And we we've gone a bit possibly a little bit overboard, and we have space elevators on every single planet now to to uh, to bring things up and down all the time. Um, and, and, and then, it, yeah, this, this works really, really well for us. Yes, we have to ship out a lot of elevator cable in order to keep them running, but we've decided that logistics cost is easier than the fuel cost of spaceship landing. I, I remember in 0.5, I, uh, I had on my oil moon uh, out here, I was, I was mining up enormous quantities of oil and just turning it straight into rocket fuel, and I had a, about five spaceships flying from er, the Aereo equivalent over to Norbit, uh, unloading, and then unloading the rocket fuel there for it to be transferred over and put into other spaceships so they could fly off, land on the ground, load up with whatever, and then blast off again, because it, there wasn't any other way of doing it until I got to the anti antimatter uh, spaceships. So having the, yes, having the space elevators has made an enormous difference, and they're also, I also find them very, very interesting because they have a different uh, type of costs to everything else in that they have a, a, a constant steady cost that where they just con steadily use cable over time whether they're being used or not and having things being different I find quite interesting and that uh, I feel adds, adds, adds quite adds, adds, it adds a lot to the game by just being being something that works differently to everything else and I'm, so I'm definitely yeah. a fan of that. And the, the interesting thing there is I don't think you mentioned power at all. Oh yes, being able to pass power through the space elevators is, is indeed and a huge game that, changer as well, yes. That's, that's why we've got them on every planet. Because if you remember when they we first started playing, I don't think they passed power through. They did, um, only one direction. I think. Ah, okay, fair enough. Oh fair. yes, yes. But the, the reason we've got them in, in orbit of every planet is, I've just jotted down, what are the, the base mechanics of Factorio Vanilla? And you've got items, you know, producing stuff, the usual stuff on a conveyor belt goes into a machine. Fluids... Power, trains, and then fighters slash combat. And I can't think of a single other mechanic in Factorio. It's actually very simplistic from that point of view. And the space elevator, because you can stick a solar panel in orbit, which has a consistent flat rate usage of power, completely negates one of those mechanics. Now, space exploration replaces that with inter-surface logistics. And you've got to think about delivery cannon versus rocket versus spaceship. So, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, and in fence, I think we'd all be really, really cheesed off if we go, oh, there's a blackout over on such such a planet. I'll get him a ship and go there and fix it. And we had that on Snowdrop fairly there. recently. We had to go out and um, f and fix that one because there was a blackout over on no, Snowdrop. We didn't oh, have to didn't, go out there. We didn't, we actually, yeah, you're right. We didn't We didn't end up having to go mm. there, but there were, we did manage to get a blackout. But then Snowdrop is a weird planet where it isn't being powered by solar because it's so far out from the sun 
that it doesn't get very much solar. So that's what mm. that's the the only case place in the in the whole system in the whole solar system where power is being brought up from the planet to the uh, to the space station rather than it going down yeah. downstream. I, I think that would be intensely irritating though if uh, if every single stream you probably have one or two planets where someone needs to go in and just go and fix the power generation because something's got a bit out of whack. I mean, I, I know there's systems you can set up to be very robust and not fail, but it would be irritating. So yeah, it, it's for me, space elevators, yes, it means that you don't have to worry about ships landing and so on, but the biggest difference really is I can power the entirety of Kothar with some solar panels. Yeah, so it doesn't, it doesn't completely eliminate having to worry about power because you need to keep going out there and putting more in, but it does make it a lot easier. So, yeah, but I just I just slap them in orbit and don't and just forget about it at that point. Whereas in my solo run, I didn't get this, this far, and I was permanently going, oh, hang on, all of the core miners are kicked in at one, all of these things are kicked in at once, and mm-hmm. as a result, my base has just gone, yep. which means I need to go and walk over there and do a thing, yeah, uh, or fly over there, and that it's just irritating. Yeah, now I think the next version of space exploration has been talking about having clones, so you can have a clone on each planet and you can switch between them, which is going to be like a Spidertron on steroids, I suppose. It's going to be uh, yeah. So there's going to, that, that's going to be you do quite a lot to help with this sort of, sort of problem, but uh, yeah, it definitely is a um, certainly a thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So let's move on to the uh, the second mod pack question, which is, what do we dislike about K two S E? Not really much. I think the the beta warfare is what came to mind because early on it's quite difficult, quite hard, and tedious manual task. And later on, it's just solved basically. You know, if if there's something to improve, I think a more balanced approach towards biters could be done. Yeah, I, I know I know what you mean. It was it was it's very it's very odd that they're sort of yeah they you, you get to a point where you have solved biters. There I think yep. I think K2 That's not bad. That's... that quite a lot. Um, because it gave you laser know... artillery and all the all the really powerful personal weapons. But yeah once you've got once you've got the um uh, plague, the plague. Rocket, yep. was, I think gone. the plague rocket is probably a bit too OP. I would like to have a, a wider arsenal to semi-automate biter killing, but not just one rocket and solve it for the whole planet. Yeah, I think that, I think that makes sense. Yeah, what, what I think would be interesting there is that Arendelle has teased a robot faction, which you will either have to fight or make peace with. And these then tease a lot of the core mechanics that will be used in that. For example, we use energy beaming to get energy around, but we've also got the umbrella defense, which blocks energy beams. And therefore, you might find that the sneaky robots come in and put an umbrella defense, blocking the energy transfer from your main power generation, things like that. So wet fighting and, and combat would become more sort of strategic layer. Hmm. I was uh, suggesting that they, they would be able to block the energy passing of heat rather than just the attack. Yes, so you could actually the, attack infrastructure. The glaive mode can be blocked by umbrella defences, I believe, or the intention has been mentioned for that. Yeah, I think that that's a thing if you play multiplayer space exploration in a hmm. sort of combative way. If another player you tried to use a glaive beam on your planet, you would need an umbrella defence to block it. Yeah, and you oh, can shoot down... have to ramp up the power to get through the yes. umbrella. Yeah, and then they have to ramp up the power and and so on forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there's also things like it is apparently possible for a meteorite defense thing to shoot down a delivery cannon capsule or a weapon delivery mm-hmm. weapon capsule or, or a weapon capsule. delivery capsule. More importantly, I don't know, Mark. Do you reckon that'd be sort of interesting from your point of view? I think the way I personally, I, I know I'm not Mark, but he wasn't answering. So <laughs> I think the way I yeah. the way I feel about that is that I'm. I don't think I'm interested in Factorio as a um, as a PvP game. Mm. But it's it's the having the robot faction that will do that as an enemy. So the biters yeah. are so local. Yep. Yeah. But I think that's a nice solution for that, to have yeah. enemies that think a bit more and are not mm. just uh, Zerks. A bit more variation. Base. Yeah. yeah. I wonder how well that would work with the uh, Factorio's um, AI system. But yeah, and certainly, certainly having different enemies that work in different ways would add a lot more interest to the game. So yeah, I think yeah. that uh, would be very good. There were a few times when it felt like he was basically working on the same thing for quite a long time. I remember, I think it was several streams when I was uh, dealing with Holmium and occasionally getting distracted with other things. But it wasn't to a massive extent and so it didn't feel too bad and I think part of that was due to streaming once a week. It was four hours, but it wasn't 12 hours straight. It was four hours, another four hours, another four hours. Mm, so it could go Which on for a month feels, potentially, and it's yeah. Yeah, we, it feels less overdone with it being spaced out like that. 
Okay, I see what you mean. I was looking so, the other way around. So I think no, I think the streaming improved that slight drawback and made it fine. Whereas if, if you're playing it on your own, then it might be if you're playing it each evening, then you're, yeah. you're doing it every evening yeah. for a uh, week or something. Yeah, it's effectively why I abandoned my sort of solo run of, of space, just space exploration, not K2SE. Because I was just like, oh, this is getting very, very samey. And that would be my sort of personal criticism that vanilla mechanics, there's only five of them. Yes, as he adds a few more. But when I was done doing Iridium, it's still basically just those five mechanics. Okay, byproducts get added in. Jolly good. Except the answer is always, 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 always in priority <laughs> input splitter. Yeah, there's no that's variety to that. Well. <laughs> it's just end to end. Oh, I've got a byproduct I don't know what to do with. Priority input splitter. Solved. I did notice. Uh, <laughs> I would. I would say not. I would add a little bit to that myself. Um, that yes, there's a lot of things where there's there's an example of, particularly in a lot of the a lot of the production systems. Like if we if we go off and have a look at um, Talos, probably why not? Uh, it's because it's the one I'm most mostly because it's the one I'm most familiar with because it's the planet I was working on. You have a lot of things where yes, you take something, you, add, you it comes out. Yes, as, as Mike says, you then put in priority splitters like this to send out the red beads this way to send them over to be reused over here, and then they, that produces blue beads you send over to be used over here, and so on. Yes, there is a lot of that where it's just feeding. Or in in some cases, it's just feeding it straight back into the same machine. Like over, over here, we're just taking the, um, the the iridium plates straight out off here and putting them back into this machine again. So that is absolutely trivial. However, I did I did think there was one other there was another type of byproduct in there, and that is when. When you're a lot of a lot of recipes produce a lot of stone or a lot of sand, and those you sometimes you need a bit of it on the planet where it's created, but a lot of the time you end up just shipping all of that. But you end up, you end up having to do something with it, whether it's send it away or turn it into landfill, or you need to do something with it, and that's a, that's a little bit different. So I'd say there's a, I'd say there's a second um, version of, of, of doing things with byproducts there. On the opposite yeah, extreme, though, there is the the angel bobs thing, where you where where you just have uh, the angel petrochem, where where everything just trees out into a million a million byproducts for each step of the recipe, or so it feels like, uh, and that is sort of frustrating in a different way. So I think there needs to be a sort of a happy medium somewhere in between. Oh, I'll, I'll go with that. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's you've got the two by uh, the two byproduct things. Yeah, okay, you've got the this didn't work properly. You feed it back into the loop. Uh, I, I mean, linked to that, actually, this, this is one of the things I liked is the concept of arcospheres and thermo fluids which aren't used or at least not mm, used that rapidly yes, agreed they are transformed that's that's i really like that because that takes the byproduct concept which i don't actually like I, I a bit of it's fine don't get me wrong you know but it, it, it's just sort of a, how do i make this harder add a byproduct now okay fair enough it's really easy and, and working in software P people point to say why can't you just do this new because mm, it's not possible uh, so, <laughs> i i, I want to be a uh, caveat this and say i'm sure that Arundel, the developer, has thought about a lot of this stuff. My, my, my go-to comment is just adding a byproduct to make it more complex isn't always the best way forwards. I accept that you've got a limited set of tools available given the constraints you're working within, and therefore, you know, fair enough. And if I, I see the, the comment do people about uh, another byproduct like wood and severe, how simply some byproducts are solved being a bit silly. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. But I also think that if every step of the Iridium process or, or the necrotype process, or whatever it is, spat out a different byproduct. We'd also tear our hair out for different. Well, I wouldn't have bald, but if I had hair, I'd tear it out uh, for different reasons. So I've now got thirty byproducts to deal with, and oh my goodness! Yeah, that's the um, that's the angel bobs way of approaching it. <clears throat> now, I guess over here, we yeah, we iridium is a fantastic example of what Mike is saying, and I think that's probably why he's thought of it in yeah. specifically. <laughs> like this, this stage of it takes in iridite and and puts out iridite and some other stuff as well including sand so this is both the thing, features I was talking about and then if we go off and we look at the next step it takes in the crushed iridite and it, and it passes out crushed iridite so again you've got that being looped round and you've got the beads being looped round as well and, and and so on so yes it's very much I think it I think it's particularly a particularly strong opinion of Mike's because he dealt with the iridium which is particularly yeah bad is a strong word for it but is particularly particularly egregious maybe is a better is a slightly yeah. better word it's got it's more syllables in it anyway yeah, every, that's absolutely right, and it was already what I was thinking of because it's the one I did. Everything I think on this planet has to have a priority input splitter there because otherwise it's it just doesn't only work. The first two steps. Is no, it, no, it, it again. Not like, yeah. not like everything. It's the iridites uh, to crushed iridites, and then it's the oh, yeah. irid, irid, crushed iridites to uh, iridium powder. No, you're quite it's right, actually only those case. two. Well, Iridium powder gets a gets a bonus mention for having two byproducts that just get looped straight back in again. <laughs> yeah, they, and the the bus cakes don't, but the ingots do. The ingots produce steam. Steam, which 
yeah, in fairness, it's, it's a different thing. So, but it's, it's, what did I do with that? Did I just did I use that for power, or did I burn it off? Power is the is the nice way of dealing with it. I, I, I don't know. Oh no, I, I dumped it into um, make the cation exchange beads. Oh yeah, okay, that's that's quite, that, yeah, that's quite a lossy nice. system. So yeah, I eventually that's the approach I did for the uh, but, uh, two uh, things get looped back. Yeah, it it, it yeah. did feel though. Like I'm bearing in mind this is the second or third iteration of this system. So I was dealing with it a lot, and it was always, huh, yeah. why is that broken? Oh, that's backed up because I didn't set that priority and put yeah. correctly. No, I, I, I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying. There, yeah. there are a lot of places where, where, where it produces, where one of the things that's produced is one of the things that went in that just hasn't been processed completely, and it just feels like, uh, why don't you just sort of ma maintain it inside the machine rather than passing it back out again? Uh, but yeah, so yeah, I, I totally, I, I, I understand your, I do completely understand your frustration, and I, I agree. It is, it is that a lot of the time. When it's just feeding something round like that, it just feels like it's doing it for the sake of it. As a slight, yeah. slightly different one is over on Talos with the um, with the Nacrotite. I was looking at this earlier; it was my first example, which is a, it was a really bad example, but it's the first one I found. Um, is where one type of processing takes in blue and produces red beads; the other type of processing takes in red and produces blue. So that's a little bit different and a little bit more interesting. But it is. But there's there's a certain amount of it being very very similar over there. Um, yeah. Been a bit With your comment on it's just a priority input splitter. I've actually on Nord. I've not done that. So I've done the it, equivalent. But it's, it's a different way of doing the same solution. Which is uh, and in fairness, loaders. that's that is how oh, I've actually done it on uh, Kothar. If you look, it is uh, now your yeah. your first builds were <laughs> passing first... it all out and using splitters and then yeah. passing it back in again, which is fine with low, for low throughput. But it starts it starts to be difficult for higher throughput levels. Yeah, and and here it's just for compactness. It goes through the splitter to because otherwise there wouldn't. Well, there probably would be enough space in fairness, but it just felt neater. It is the honest truth there. So it's the same vein how I've done it in the end, but it, it's still the concept of I've still got to set that thing up to deal with a, a byproduct. In fairness, the flip side of the coin, core processing, that's essentially pure byproduct. You can <laughs> say the product yep. is the byproduct. Yeah. The, and yeah. that is really interesting. Um, because you you've got this just big dump out and it's okay it's not a priority input splitter because you're deliberately you know in goes core fragments out comes a bit of everything and so you have to balance how the rate you're using everything at in order to make sure that your input of something doesn't doesn't dry up yeah so if you don't yeah. if you don't use the iron fast enough then you might not get any more copper through because it's backed up all the way now obviously at this stage we've solved that problem and um, we have um but the easy the obvious way to do it is that you just make sure you prioritize the uh the, the take using your using the iron from core processing before you use the iron from mines and um, and what we've done is basically just a bigger and more advanced version of that. Yes. And that I, I mean you don't have to balance it necessarily. So I know that in my solo run, because obviously pyroflux you don't use until a bit further on. I just had about 150 storage tanks just stockpiling. So you you, you can get away with some stockpiling, but yeah, you, the theory is that this is. I, I think it's supposed to be a way of providing all the base resources on other planets. Uh, so you get a slow trickle of everything, so you never get into a situation where you can't progress. And we've used that quite um, a lot. But we've used the iron ore that's coming out of the core processing to make barrels, for example, or to make sulfuric acid, and then just ship the rest of it that we don't need back over to Norvis in the spaceships for, uh, for yeah. sorting and processing and so on. Yeah. So you, yeah, I think it, yes, it makes a lot of sense. And when I, th when I say when I say balance, I, I mean I don't mean you have to make sure that you use equal amounts of all of the things. I mean you, need, you have to make sure that you have you potentially have them the, the ones that get used the most being topped up. And because you can yeah. only you can only core mine process you can only core process at the speed of the thing you use up the slowest um, unless you find some way of sinking it and turning it all into landfill. But that's a, yeah ra ratio to the generation rates. But yes, yes, yeah. I'm with you in principle. Sphere is talking about yeah the, the, the flying enemies would be flying enemies would indeed be interesting. Uh, Frugal says that the uh, biters are a resource issue. So yes, yeah, I, I guess that's true. The the one failure case of Factorio really is you get overrun probably because you ran out of iron. So yes, the, the biters. Are are very much an iron sink in the early game and then they turn into an iron and copper sink and then possibly uranium sink and then into just a power sink as you use the lasers to defeat them or perhaps you push them back far enough with your artillery that you don't really they're not really a strong sink so yes they are just another way another way to sink resources that's very true 
Um, and the, so apparently the devs have said, uh, is this not, is that in um, in uh, vanilla? You're saying the biters are no longer expected to be a problem later on. And I guess, and that is true. Yeah. Once you get, although even even then, even once you got artillery, I would say, I suppose actually no. Once you get once you get high powered armor and all that sort of stuff, you can basically just go out there and, and run through a biter base and destroy it with your uh, and be absolutely fine with shields and um, and whatnot. So yeah, I, I think yes, I, I basically agree. Uh, and yes, as um, as Mike has said, the, uh, yes, the, the, your combatability scale mass to massively high levels, but the enemies don't. <laughs> very, yes, exactly. Yeah, on, on that one, it, it just means, and this is kind of what Mike was saying. It's it's the the progressions don't match. Yes. So from, and and in, in fairness, going back to what we said right, or what Lawrence said right at the start about you know this is a, a mod pack. It's in development. Aaron Dell has explicitly said that he's currently focusing on getting the systems right, so that the content that he builds on the systems a doesn't break, but b has systems there to support it. Hmm, and that makes sense. Especially now, as he works for Ruby and can, and can start sort of sneaking yeah, implementing think, things in the background if he needs exactly, to. Exactly, I think that's Ooh. his his he needs for for what he said, what he's planning for point uh, zero point seven or one point zero of space exploration. I think the whole space age thing seems like a a plot of him to just uh, get the technologies <laughs> basis for his uh, expansion there. So Theorist commented, commented um, a little while ago that um, building up same factories on every planet, uh, there's yeah that that is definitely a definitely a, a thing. I think we got round that by just shipping all of the ores back and going we don't care, just send all of this stuff back and deal with it on over on Norvis. And we could do that because we had big chunky spaceships available by this point. Uh, by the time we're by the time we're doing heavy core mining, and we and we even with the delivery cannons we're doing it to an extent. So yeah, we weren't doing that. But, but then once you've got that sort of system up and ready, it is just going to be a case of copying and pasting, and the bots will build it for you. So I think. I sort of agree, but I sort of think it's not that big a deal. But but also, I pr where where we have been using, for example, iron out on other planets, we've not been doing a a good smelting setup. We've been doing a quick and dirty, easy smelting setup because we know we're not actually getting through all that much. And if we and anything that we do get through in large quantities, will be shipping out in the spaceship, and so it'll be being made in the all the iron for that or whatever will be being made in the proper good foundries over on Norvis. Frugal asks if we right. really want the biters to scale at the same rate that we do. Part of the threat is that. Uh, you have to defend more area. Yeah, so we wouldn't want them to go quite as quick. We wouldn't want them to develop quite as quickly as we do. However, I think it's too far in the opposite direction to the point where they're just now absolutely trivial in that with one of our combat armors, you can just sort of almost fly straight across the world. You can go anywhere and you, just every biter within range of your lasers dies. It, they're, they're, or, you, yep. or you drop a plague rocket on the planet and it wipes every single one of them out. It's gone slightly too far in that they are now basically trivial. There's levels of trivial, though. I think I think in in standard Factorio, they're they're easy to deal with, but you need to go out and do so. It's not it's not too much of a challenge. I think space exploration, especially with Crastorio two added in as well, has perhaps taken it a little bit too far. Uh, in that they've been trivialized a little bit too much. Oh yeah, one of the other things that came uh, that I thought of was that in in 0.6, it's uh, it's the logistic effort of, of transporting stuff before it's been processed has been ramped up to an, an enormous extent. So you've got things like you you t take the um, the ores that you where we can get 50 of them in a stack, and then you need I don't know how many hundred of them to make one ingot, and then the ingots still stack up to 20 or 50 or something like that, 100 in this case in fact. So if you want to. So if you end up, if you decide you want to ship the ores back to Norvis and process them there, it's an enormously bigger job. On the one hand, I fully understand the, the push for having bigger processing systems out on the uh, other planets because otherwise they just feel like each planet just feels like a mining outpost. But on the flip side, it's possibly gone a little bit too far in forcing you to do it this way. I don't really know how strongly I feel about this. On the one hand, it'd be nice to have the choice. On the other hand. As I say, if, if given the choice, most, many gamers would just optimise all of the fun out of the game, unquote. And so having the having to, having to build up your your sub factories out on the other planets to, to do the the processing of those ores is kind of nice because it means you you then end up with a number of factories rather than just feeding everything into the same central place to get everything running. I, I, I'm sort of ambivalent about this. I don't know exactly how to feel about. It. I, I don't know exactly which way I, my my feelings fall on this one because it certainly it, I, it goes both ways to an extent. Yeah, I, th I think there's a halfway house. So for Kothar, for example, crushing the erudite, as soon as you turn it to powder, you need other stuff. Quite a bit of, you know, with its own, I mean, it's not complex, but it's also not trivial production chains. 
Mm-hmm. So for me, it's you. If you're doing core mine, you get the core mines. You uh, break that down to the regular erudite, and then you crush the erudite. And that at that point, it stacks to forty, which is I mean, it's not great, but it's not horrendous. It's got a bit of sand as a byproduct, plus all of your core mine stuff. If you've done that, which is you know again pretty minor. That's not too bad to ship. But if you don't ship it at that stage, you're bringing in shed loads of bits and bobs, like all the vulcanite bits. So I have two separate kinds of vulcanite coming in. Actually, three, uh, sorry, no, two, but I made Pyroflux on site. Uh, and so, so I suddenly, I have got shipping costs, but it's shipping in, not shipping out. Yeah. So you could go to a halfway where you say, I'm going to crush it down until I need an import, at which point I have to add that logistical complexity. So why not ship it back to a, cent- uh, a central hub? And that's kind of what we've done with Naquium. Uh, in that we, we're bringing in the Naquatite, and I'm, in, in Stardust at least, it's being crushed on site, and this does require quite a lot of resources to bring it in, because Naquium is the end game material, and therefore everything is a lot more complicated, so fine. Um, but it's, um, uh, but yeah, we're doing the first stage of it here. Now, part of the, a, lot, a large part of the reason we're then shipping it off from here isn't just because when, when we go back over to Talos, uh, you require a hundred different um, in- ingredients, although you do, you do have to bring in a lot of different things because it's, it's end game resources, you require everything. Uh, but also because if once you get it onto a planet, you can then start using productivity modules. And with it being expensive and difficult, we want to up that as far as we possibly can and be producing it and, and be getting as much out of it as we can. So, yeah, the, the, this is this is the one where we have gone for the halfway house of we're, we're shipping it over, we're crushing it on site and then shipping it. Although, interestingly, Mike has done a similar thing on Kothar over here. I, cr- I crush by the mine and then ship it back to the main thing. Mine. Then I'm putting it into a system because I'd already brought all the things in. But there's no reason I couldn't have then stuck it on in the early game delivery cannons slash rockets um, and then in the late game uh, spaceships. There's no reason I couldn't have done that instead. Let's see. So you produce for every... For the, for the ingots, so over the last, let's look at the last hour. So you, for every, every 15, it takes 15 crushed iridite to make one iridium ingot. So there's quite a big drop in there. Although, however, I don't know what they stack to. It stacks to 40. Iridium ingots stacks to 20, sorry, 20. Right, and the crush stacks to 40. So it, you're ha- half, the, half the stack size, but 60. So you're getting about eight times as much being transported. So you would need eight times as many spaceships if you transported it as crushed and then processed it further at the other side. You, now, you, you, you point out that you are bringing stuff in in order to do, the, do that processing, the Vulcanite and so on, but that's being brought over by a spaceship that would have to come over anyway to pick the stuff up. So it is definitely, there's definitely less logistics required in order to ship it as ingots and there is, than there would be if you shipped it as crushed. However, it comes down to whether you think the complexity is worth it. So it's a, it's a, it's a logistics cost versus logistics complexity thing. Yeah, I, I think you also need to factor in robustness because we've had it's only in the early days. Running out of there was, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 there have been three different reasons why we've run out of Vulcanite on Kothar. The first one was well, we never had any because the priority was to somewhere else. And that's fine. It, the system still being built, or it was being expanded. I think is a better way of phrasing it. Hmm. Uh, we then had one in the middle where something went wrong on I think it was Agnea, and as a result, the Vulcanite throughput just went through the floor. Relatively speaking, didn't have enough. And then the third one was, there was a deadlock on the ships, which meant that nothing was getting through. That was it, the Iridium backed up to the point where, a pri- it, it, it wasn't a priority input splitter, it was a pump had its priorities not quite set right, and the whole thing backed up and just ground to halt and had to go and, and flush some stuff yeah. and, and deal now, with it. The first two of those would be fixed, would, wouldn't, it wouldn't make any difference whether you're doing it locally or remotely, because either way, it was you, you have to wait until there is enough Vulcanite available, then it could be loaded into the spaceships or loaded into the system, and the system will start running again. So I don't mm. think that makes it, it would, I don't think that would make any difference whether you're doing it on Kothar or whether you're shipping all the crushed stuff back over to Norvis to ship ah. to process there. The difference on the second one was that it was being supplied by delivery cannon from memory. The second one was the first, anyway, this one was being supplied by delivery cannon, and you had a belt. And that meant that the further upstream on the belt you were, that was the priority system. Mm. And it just wasn't making it down as far as Kothar. Whereas if it's all in one hub and you're using a sp- just a regular splitter, it's going to go 50-50 each way. So you'll get a dribble. Or it's going to go 50, 25, 12 and a half. <laughs> yeah, a but you, you, you get yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. There are ways yeah. of distributing it yes. more cleanly. However, I think I think that still it still comes down to the basic problem is there wasn't enough Vulcanite being produced and shipped through. And so yeah. now we've... Um, now that's been sorted, uh, so it is just a case of any 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 system, no matter where it is, would have the same problems for the same sort of reasons. Yeah. 
So, and, I, and I'm with you on that. I mean, in, in my mind, it's then the distributed production thing has the robustness issue because that can lead to knock-on impacts. I'm not sure I agree. I think you're going to still have. I think you're still going to have the same the same issues all the way along, almost no matter what. Uh, if, if there isn't enough, if there isn't enough vulcanite being fed into the system, then there isn't enough vulcanite in the system, and. When you went once there is enough vulcanite again, then Kothar kicked back into running and, and carried on working. Also, it'd be it's just as easy to get a priority pump or a pump priority setup wrong on Norvis as it is anywhere else. So, whilst I I, I agree that it's it, there's, it feels more complicated to be shipping a hundred different things out to a planet in order to do the processing there. I don't think that the reasons you're suggesting are reasons not to do it. You might it, the reason not to do it might be just because it's a pain to sort out all the logistics and try and keep everything going into the right places, and that's definitely valid. But I'm not sure I would agree uh, on, on yeah on, on on the other bit. Um, Sophia is asking for Mark's opinion on this. We need, we need the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. There is no right way to do it. Um, I, as a next try, I would try to have a central process everything planet or orbit or not probably because of productivity of planet. That way um, you, you have small smaller outposts, uh, easier to set up, uh, easier to, to, you know, to do the remote work and uh, have mm. one central place to optimize, basically. Fair enough. Um, I'm afraid that means you're mostly agreeing with Mike. My argument against that was <laughs> using, the, um, using the Iridium specifically as an example, that would require eight times as much logistics yeah. throughput. Yeah, yeah. The, the ratios for, for space exploration are in a way that um, this is a hard decision, really. Yes. So there is no right way to do it. If, you know, if the, <laughs> the numbers, the stack sizes were a bit different, um, I think it's easier to argument for either way. Yeah, and that actually comes back to where we started. I was saying that I f that 0 0.6 tried a bit too hard to make you process things where you dug them up. Yeah. Um, although if we then, if we, in the future we start to get funny planets where you can only do certain processes on certain planets, then that's going to hmm. force yep. you in a, in a slightly different ways. And I think that's all we've got time for in this video. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that's been interesting and given you a little bit of insight into why we did some of the things and and how we do things. Perhaps do things differently if we play it again. In the next video, we'll take a look at how we how we found playing with each other and how multiplayer went as opposed to sort of single player and what we liked and disliked about the whole group thing. So I hope you'll come back and join me for that. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>